These teenage sisters believe they're haunted well. by a poltergeist. I was going to ask the same question as I asked earlier. How many voices are there? Six hundred. Six hundred the voices. I know the joke. How many really are there, Margaret? I think so far we've had ten. Three. Um, sensible voices, but the rest of the names are absolute rubbish. Eleven-year-old Janet Hodgson appears to be the focus of many of the strange happenings in Green Street, but they also affect her 14-year-old sister Margaret and their younger brother Billy. One of the first manifestations was when Lego bricks began to fly at high speed around the living room. How does it feel to be haunted by a poltergeist? It's not haunted. Shut up. Why isn't it haunted? I don't know. I'm... Does it frighten you, the things that happen here? Uh -huh. Well, it did first, but now I've got more used to it. And you learn to accept the things that happen. It's slang covered it, Mum. My eat it, Mum. Slung a bookshelf at Mum. Yeah. Have you tried telling it to go away? Yes, many times. No, nothing. And what does it reply? Mm. No, it won't. It's staying another six, seven years. The local police could find no explanation for the knocking either. They were even more baffled when two of their beat constables reported seeing an armchair levitate across the Hodgson's living room. It um, came off the floor, or maybe a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet, before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't, it didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. Maurice Gross is an electronics engineer and an investigator for the Society for Psychical Research. Over here was Janet, and over here in this bed here was Margaret. It was in the same bedroom a month later with all the family present that Maurice Gross first challenged the poltergeist to talk. And this was actually the result. You'll hear here uh, the whistling first of all and then the barking. And here is this Barking here is quite extraordinary, actually. I then said to it, you can whistle. I then, uh, as I said on the tape here, I then said to it, if you can whistle and bark and groan, then you can talk. And I asked it to actually say my name. <laughs> I want you to call out my name, my complete name, Morris Gross. See if you can do that. Hello. Very good. Let me hear you say my name again. Come on, let me hear you say my name. Come on, my name's Morris, let me hear you say it. Morris. Now that was the first time we heard the voice, and since then we've been hearing it again and again, and it's been getting louder and louder. What about the voices? When, when did the voices start? She's saying we're there 12. 
December the 12th? Yes. And how did this start? Well, one night Mr. Grove was talking about it, about 8 30. He said, All we need now is a voice to talk. And that night I went to bed and I can't remember exactly what happened. And What's that knocking? Yeah, that's. I can hear it now. I was doing that yesterday morning and Peggy was on her own. So she came in to us because it wasn't her, she came in. We sat together and we heard it. And I counted down with knocks and there was 14 altogether. And it's doing it again now. That was three knocks just now? Yes, it goes in threes and twos. Now we first got contacted, this was when Mr. Rose said, if there's anyone there, not twice, but yes, and if not, one for now. I wonder if we did that now, whether it would answer. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? It doesn't always do it to order. No, it doesn't. It goes in spasms. Like we're talking now, it may not now after you've said that, but you won't do it when you want it to straight away. No. What about the voices? They sometimes um, say things and make answers. Mm. Is that the voice now? Yeah. Is anybody there? How many voices are there? Dirty oh. Dick, Andrew Garner, and Stuart Thurton. Dirty Dick, Andrew Garner, and Stuart, Stuart Thurton. Thurton. Oh, has he ever spelt that for you? No. Mr. Groves asked him, but it's like you struck Mr. Groves last night when you asked. Or some time ago. And Sorry. what what do you yeah. think? these are? Are they people or are they just voices? Could be spirits, how are they? It's a ghost, a spirit, speaking for us somehow. No. We don't get this at school, these voices are. Because I'll be when we're all separate, it's not so strong. Just when you come near each other? Yeah, like here or our aunts, we will up there together or in Peggy's next door. And Janet, your voice is stronger, isn't it? It seems to be the strongest. Yeah. Does, when you hear the voice and it comes out, where does it come from? Here, your throat? No. Where do you feel it comes Back from? Back of the neck. Back of the neck. And so it must be as if it's somebody else speaking then. When you hear yeah, it. behind us. And do you get the feeling when you hear the voice that there is a person there? Yes. Yeah. And do they tell you much about themselves? Not really, no. They just tend to growl and... and play around and sort of joke and be silly. No. I wonder, do you think there's anyone there just now? Yeah. I do. Who's that? What? Who's that, Janet? Pardon? Who? Stuart Certain. Stuart Certain, and he's one of the voices? Yeah. Why do you think he comes and speaks through you? To noise, to annoy us. Does he ever say anything nice? Well... Don't know really. Shall we Says try and speak to him? No. We'll see if he'll speak to us. Yeah. Is anybody there? No, no. 
Who's there? Doctor A. Doctor Who? Chases here. Mr. Gross, a lot of people hearing these voices produced by the children will mm -hmm. simply say that they are very good ventriloquists mm -hmm. and that this is all a hoax. Mm -hmm. How would you react to that? Certainly not. Um, they're, they're certainly not very good ventriloquists. We have had tests on them to see whether they can ventriloquize. They can't. Um, to keep up this particular type of voice, for any length of time, without damage to the vocal cords, is absolutely impossible. I mean, there must be some hoarseness attached to it. But don't forget, these children don't do this for a couple of minutes or so. They do it for lengths of periods up to three hours, and without any hoarseness or sore throats whatsoever. Well, perhaps, Guy, perhaps you've got something to say, sir. Yeah. I'd like to know how you make this noise without bashing Janet's vocal cords to pieces. If I do yeah. it for half a minute, I get a sore throat. Joe? Guy Lyon Playfair is an author of books on the paranormal, with experience of poltergeist cases in Europe and Brazil. How do you do it, mate? God, that hours. Don't you ever get a sore throat, Janet? No. Sure? Yeah. You never get pain in the back of the neck or something? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, what do you mean? I'll, I'll dance for you. I'm not with you. What? Well, oh, you're with me now. Really? Um, sensation in the back of my neck. Yeah. Well, tell us about that. I've been no, tell me about. Tell me about that. You get it. You get it now. It's buzzing in the back of your neck. Yeah. Do you feel it vibrating as if it was sort of? Um, no, like someone. Someone what? Put their hands on the back of my neck like that. Poltergeists seem to thrive on an atmosphere of tension that is partly sexual. The fact that most of the focuses are adolescents seems to contribute to the mischievous nature of the effects, leading some to suggest that the kids are faking or enjoying a laugh at the expense of the investigators. But to create all the bizarre effects that went on in this house either involves a gigantic conspiracy with the neighbours or a disruption in our laws of mind and matter.